The dividing line between life and death is unimaginably thin. When we think of a biological organism, the human body, of utmost scrutiny and molecular precision, we realize that over time, we are bound to decay. We forget the fact that health is not our default state. My name is Simon. I'm a doctor of medicine, a master of surgery, Canada McGill, and a researcher. And being a medical student, we have a very particular framework of how we understand diseases. First and foremost, we have to understand how a system functions. And from that derivation, understanding how diseases occur. Understanding anatomy is also very important in relation to one another. We are all fighting against one common enemy. Death, disease, and illness. And the very principles, the very foundations of medicine, as you can see, is prevention of disease, promotion and maintenance of health, and relief of pain and suffering. And it's a very important principle because it uses evidence-based knowledge, uses details so that we can find pharmaceutical approaches to different conditions and modalities. So I'll give you an example. For example, I work in Alzheimer's disease. To understand Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease, we need to understand the brain. Alzheimer's disease progresses and starts for the medial temporal lobe, right where I'm pointing at. And you have different proteins, amyloid, beta, and tau particularly. And over time, they aggregate to the neocortices. So understanding the system helps in the disease. Now, this is a very important principle because as physicians or aspiring physicians, we need to understand the human condition. And this talk really goes deep into that very fundamental basis. So back in 2018, this is a photo of me at UCSF, Department of Neurosurgery. I used to go to the operating room to collect brain tumors. So the neurosurgeon would resect tumors and I would collect them, bring it to the laboratory and study it the molecular architecture of what makes a brain tumor. What you can see over here, I don't have a laser, the vial over there, I'm holding in my hands a tumor called glioblastoma multiforme. It's the most aggressive of the brain tumors with a very poor prognosis, resistant to therapy. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking to myself, what makes a life what it is, and how ought we to fill it with ideas, emotions, connections, etc.? And that really has become the center of my talk itself. This is really the progenitor of this talk. And just because of my background, I'm going to maybe give you an illustration. I like to walk around, so you'll see me in a more dynamic fashion. What do you see over here? Uh, first of all, this is an MRI imaging, and it's flipped. So the right side is actually pointing to the left side. And what you can see in the frontal area is this mass, and that's glioblastoma. Now, Again, in medicine, we need to use numbers because as physicians and scientists, we need to find and derive clinical and statistical significance. What do you observe over here is a Kaplan-Meier curve. A Kaplan-Meier curve essentially on the x-axis shows the temporal progression of a disease. So how many days does it take until someone has an operation? And on the y-axis, you see the overall survival of that patient. Every dip that you can observe is a life lost. Now, we use numbers because numbers help us understand things, but each of those numbers are people with ambitions, love, dreams, fears, concerns. And that really made me think, as an aspiring physician scientist, of what exactly is it that matters? You see, in medicine, we have a rather linear approach. We have problems, and we try to find the solutions to those problems. But what do you do? What do you do when you have an incurable disease? What do you do in a case of a patient that's cachexic and their body's degenerating, and despite our best efforts, all the treatment modalities have failed? You see, we're no longer talking about a clinical question. This is a more of a philosophical approach, because we are really trying to get into the depth of the pain and suffering. And as such, I have selected this slide, and I will actually read it verbatim to you, because it's extremely important before I interpret it for you. It's by the American philosopher, Martha Nussbaum. She writes, and I quote, the condition of being good is that it should always be possible for you to be morally destroyed by something you could not prevent. To be a good human being is to have a kind of openness to the world, an ability to trust on certain things beyond your own control, that can lead you to be shattered in very extreme circumstances for which you were not to blame. That says something very important about the human condition of the ethical life, that it is based on a trust in the uncertain and on a willingness to be exposed it is based on being more like a plant than like a jewel, something rather fragile. 
but whose very particular beauty is inseparable from its fragility. Let's derive some points from this. The first of which, as you can see, is a paradox between the uncertainty that we have and the trust that we put into other people, events, things, things that matter to us. And why is that? The reason is we derive meaning in relation to others. So that's one premise. The second premise about pain and suffering, which is a very important argument, is that it's not that pain and suffering is a byproduct of life. It's that pain and suffering is interwoven with life. It's part of the human condition. And it is impossible to separate the two. There's another derivation we can arrive from that. And that is that during pain and suffering, we feel most human. It doesn't matter what culture you belong in. It doesn't matter what language you speak. There are certain elements of truth that are preserved in that. And as physicians, and by the way, what does it mean to be a physician? Being a physician would not make any sense without patients. So we find our relationship in relation to the patient. Another very important point. So as you can see, when treatment modalities fail, when there's nothing else that we can do, we need to look for other options. Things that connect us to something greater. Things that go beyond our corporeality of the physical body that I talked about. And I'm going to take you through a journey. And this journey really goes with uh, Frédéric François Chopin, a genius composer, one of the greatest of the Romantics born in Poland. And uh, the photo that you see is one of only three surviving photos of Chopin. The writer Oscar Wilde talks about Chopin and he says, that when he plays Chopin, he's weeping over fears and sorrows that were not his own, and the looming tragedy that were not his. So there are certain elements, and we will actually demonstrate this, and I will be talking to you about a piece about Chopin, so we can really appreciate what that really is. But before we do that, I mentioned he's a romantic composer, but what does it mean? Is it romance in the sense of love? No. Back in Europe in the time, uh, where we had Newton's Principia Mathematica being published and discussed, and we had the philosophers discussing different topics, trying to find rationality and reason, Immanuel Kant's landmark essay, what is enlightenment? Europe was in a time of great reasoning. Now, as we progress, and with every epoch and era, there are different trends and there are different ideas that get expressed. And one of this, and I think it's very, very important, of the Romantic tradition, is the idea of freedom and human subjectivity. And I really love this photo. It's by Josef Donhauser. You can see over here the Hungarian composer, virtuoso Franz Liszt, sitting at the piano. And uh, we have other composers. I'll just name it for the sake of completion. We have Rossini standing beside Paganini, Italian composers. And uh, we have Georges Sand, Chopin's lover, sitting in the chair. And you see the idea of magnetism, the idea that the virtuoso endowed itself with a creative genius. And that's very important, because in addition to that genius, we have the formation of identities. Right. Chopin was Polish, he wrote mazurkas, polonaises, these are Polish dances, Liszt wrote the Hungarian rhapsodies. So we have identity formation through nationalism, another hallmark. The, uh, there's more, I don't want to talk about it, but surrendering to nature, again, brings me back to the theme of this talk, of the human condition. So what I like to do, I mean, I like anatomy, so this is a depiction of Chopin's hands, it's from the museum. What I like to do actually here now is to not play the piece because, well, that doesn't really provide us with enough appreciation, what I'd like to do is to maybe introduce the piece for you, what I will be playing. And what will I be playing, by the way? I'll be playing the Chopin Nocturne in C minor, opus 48, number one. And there's something I really love about this piece. The thing that I love about this piece is that we often think about the hero's journey. It's a concept that was developed by uh, William Campbell in his book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. And the basic idea is this. The protagonist, the hero, goes through a tumultuous journey with struggles, with pain, with strife. It could be Hercules, it could be Rostam in Ferdowsian poetry. And what eventually happens with these dynamic changes is that the hero overcomes triumphantly. This nocturne is the hero's journey, but in reverse. There's no winning here. There's a sense of trying to really hold on to something that no longer is. And people might be wondering why I'm wearing gloves. Uh, my fingers are very cold, unlike my heart, so I'll be wearing this so that uh, we will be using this. Now, what I will do for you is I'll play it for you. Okay, so if we could uh, hopefully enjoy the piece together.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So, as you can see, and this is actually another one of the final points, one of the profound points, I'm going to illustrate this because I'm an illustrative person. You see, these are black and white notes on a sheet of paper, two-dimensional objects. But within them, we can find the full range of human emotions. It's not so much that, and it is true, that music triggers emotions, feelings of nostalgia, and all of that. It's true. But the more profound realization is that within this music, we have the collectivity of the human experience, the human conditions, the suffering, the pain, the fears, the concerns, the trepidations. And that's really profound and humbling to realize, that there is a greater connection beyond us, and that we can find it in great art, and that great art helps us in understanding things when medicine or research stops, music begins. And perhaps uh, on that very note, I think that if we were to have a takeaway, perhaps, what is the ultimate takeaway of this someone? What, what, what would be the point of this in two sentences? I would say the following. Self-discovery is a slow but natural process. There are no shortcuts for attaining wisdom. Thank you. <laughs>